Have you ever wondered why we find action films so compelling to watch, especially if you don't consider yourself to be a violent person? Why is it so satisfying to watch someone dodge a kick, throw a punch, knock a guy out, and then jump out of the window of an exploding building? Likewise, why do we enjoy watching dance so much? Well, understanding these mechanisms can help to shed a little bit of light on the way that the human brain actually works. And it also shows us how we can use visualization to train in techniques almost as effectively as if we were actually practicing them for real. So to understand this, we first need to rewind a little bit and look at how the brain handles any kind of movement. So movement is generally controlled by the motor cortex. This is a brain region located around here at the top, and it's essentially mapped pretty much one-to-one -one with different parts of your body. So you have parts of your motor cortex that represent your hands, parts that represent your feet, your neck, your tongue. And the size of these regions depends on how sensitive and how articulate those areas are. If you were to stimulate individual neurons within the motor cortex, this would cause those parts of your body either to move or for you to feel sensation in those areas. So when we make any movement, first the necessary region of the motor cortex lights up, that sends the signal down our bodies and we make the movement. But the motor cortex doesn't work entirely on its own. It also is supported by various other brain regions, including the cerebrum, the basal ganglia, and the premotor cortex and the supplementary motor cortex. And the one we're interested in is the premotor cortex, because in here, we see activity prior to a movement. This is where we prepare for a movement. And areas within that part of the brain light up prior to the same areas, respectively, in the motor cortex lighting up. And this is how we visualize a movement. Before you make any movement, you first visualize it. And if you think back, you're probably actually consciously aware of this to some degree. So if you're gonna go and throw a ball at a wall and then try and catch it, you'll predict the trajectory of that ball. You'll feel yourself do it prior to doing it. You'll feel the movement, how you should move. And then that's kind of preparing your body for that movement before it's sent over to the motor cortex and down. And then your supplementary motor cortex does things like helping you with your balance and with spatial awareness, etc. There's lots more going on, but basically the pre-motor cortex is for planning and visualization, and then the motor cortex is for execution. So when we go to make a movement, we visualize the movement first, and then we execute on it and we perform it. If our visualization was correct and the movement goes the way we want it to, then we get the release of positive hormones and of reward hormones like dopamine, and that strengthens the neural connections that caused that movement and that visualization of that movement. So when we predict something correctly, reward hormones are released and we feel good about it because that makes us more likely to make that movement again next time or more likely to predict the movement of something else correctly next time. When we get it wrong, then we don't get that release because it was wrong and the brain doesn't want to enforce that belief or that behavior. So this is how we learn to walk. We stand up, we fall off balance, we hurt ourselves. So we don't do that again, we do it slightly differently. We get it right, we put a foot forwards, don't fall over, the brain releases dopamine and that neural connection is slightly strengthened. And over time, our movement improves over and over, more and more, and we develop that physics model as well. And this is why visualization training works. This is why you can improve your ability, say in a dance routine or a martial arts form or kata, not by necessarily having to practice it in person, but just by visualizing it, by imagining yourself doing it. When you do that, brain areas are lighting up in your brain in the premotor cortex, just as though you were making those movements for real. And as we know, Neurons that fire together, wire together. So it doesn't matter to your brain that you're not actually engaging in that action. As far as it's concerned, you pretty much are. Those neurons are firing and you're forming those connections which will help you to improve your technique. This also helps us in the gym. If you're struggling with your squatting form or your deadlift, you can visualize yourself doing it and really feel yourself going through the motion as though you're actually doing it. And that will help to strengthen the connections which will improve your performance and your technique when you actually go to do it for real. Of course, you have to be somewhat careful here because if you're practicing it incorrectly in your brain, then this can lead to negative plasticity. That means brain plasticity, the formation of new neural connections, but not for a positive end, for an actually negative end. It's actually making you worse at performing that particular technique. And recent research shows us that we don't only predict our own movements in these parts of the brains, but also the movements of things around us. The trajectory of projectiles, for instance, or if we were to throw an object, we'd predict how that object moves. So if you're imagining throwing a ball, you don't just imagine how you need to move your arm. You then predict the movement of that ball through space. You watch it bounce off a wall and come back to you. So in other words, we have an inbuilt physics engine that we run, no doubt learned through years and years of interaction with our real world. So if you're someone who throws a lot of balls, you become better at predicting the movement of those balls, the weight, 
the feel and thus you become more accurate when you're throwing and catching. And we even have our own theory of mind involved here. Theory of mind is our idea of how other people will think and behave and studies show it's missing in people with autism and very young children. But as we grow up um, in the normal healthy developing brain, we learn the way that other people react to our actions and we become better at predicting that. My advantage is rage. Incoming assault, feral, but experienced. So if you're visualizing a fight, for instance, you not only have to predict how you're gonna move, you have to predict how the opponent's gonna move. And that's the limitation of visualization training because you can predict how you're gonna move, you can perform the action, you can uh, learn a kata or a dance routine, but you can't necessarily predict precisely how the weight's gonna move, how that's gonna feel, how the ball's gonna move, or how an opponent will throw punches at you. So visualization training is useful to an extent. And whilst it could potentially increase the mind-muscle connection, muscle fiber recruitment, I don't know about that, it certainly won't cause muscle fiber tears, it won't cause the buildup of metabolites. You're not gonna get stronger, you're not gonna build muscle by lying in bed imagining going to the gym. You will just might improve your technique. What's even more fascinating about all this, and what you'll already know if you watch my video on embodied cognition, is that we also use the same process to understand words that people say to us, things that are happening in the world around us, everything really. Because when someone talks to you, uh, you have to translate that into meaning in your brain. We, we have different languages, but obviously there's a kind of base code of the brain. How do we understand something? How do we turn words into meaning that we can act on? We can think of this a little bit like a computer code. You type in basic, in Python, in Java, in C, but the computer converts that into machine code, binary, in order to actually act on it, in order for it to have a physical impact on that machine. So how do words have an impact on our brain? Well, for a while, psychologists didn't know and they just called it mental ease. They called that the, the arbitrary base code of the brain. But now the ruling theory is something called embodied cognition. This is the idea that we understand things because we visualize them. So, so when someone talks to me and tells me that they went for a run, I actually visualize a person going for a run or I even visualize myself running. I can feel what it's like to run when someone says something's cold. My body experiences that cold by visualizing it. And there is evidence to show that this is probably what's happening. When someone talks to you, brain scans show that the relevant areas in your brain light up as though that thing were happening to you. So our understanding of abstract concepts like maths and programming, even those things are probably based on our interactions with the world around us. For instance, maths is based on our idea of quantity, which we learn through interactions with the world. So what does all this have to do with action and watching things explode? Well, this comes down to the action of mirror neurons. So mirror neurons are neurons that fire when we see someone else experience something or make a movement. So in studies, monkeys have watched other monkeys using their hands to grasp things. And whilst they were observing that behavior, they were having brain scans and they saw that in the premotor cortex of those monkeys, the observer monkeys, the same patterns of activity were seen as would be expected in the monkey that was actually moving. So in other words, when we see something happen, we visualize it, we feel it. That's why we cringe when we watch someone who's in a very embarrassing situation. That's why we wince when we see someone get hurt. And yeah, basically, it's probably the foundation of most of our social interactions. So what happens when you watch Jackie Chan kick someone over a bridge? Well, on the one hand, you feel yourself as though you're kicking the person over the bridge. And on the other hand, you feel as though you're falling off a bridge. And at the same time, you're observing the physics of everything that's happening. When you see a building explode, you're observing the physics of everything that's happening. So this is actually improving our mental model of movement, both for ourselves and for objects in the world. It's causing brain plasticity. So when we're watching someone fight or when we're watching something explode, we're visualizing it and we're feeling it as though it's really happening. And at the same time, our brain is learning from that. It's predicting how that movement's gonna be. And then it's rewarding us if we get it right and it's letting go of that if we get it wrong. This is how computer games work. We're taught a particular set of inputs will result in a reward. If we get it perfectly right, dopamine. If we get it slightly wrong, no dopamine. And that kind of instant feedback loop is what makes it so addictive. And the same thing happens when we watch a dance. We see people moving beautifully. We predict the trajectory. We feel as though we're doing it and we feel as though we are dexterous and as though we have got that kind of amazing spatial awareness. And because that's a positive desirable trait, we're learning through observation and our brain is releasing those positive neurotransmitters and hormones that we find so great, so good feeling, so addictive. So we now know 
that we can visualize training in order to get better at something. And in theory, it also means that observing other people engaging in a behavior will make us better at that behavior. So if you love bodybuilding, watch loads of YouTube channels, watch loads of videos of people performing deadlifts and bench presses. If you love uh, fighting, then watch people fight. If you love dance, then watch people dance. You'll ingrain it more and more just by watching it and you should become better at performing it yourself. But do be aware that we're all differently built. We all have different limb lengths. We all have different strengths and weaknesses. And physics varies a lot depending on the weight of objects. So of course there's limitations here again and you can mislearn through observation too. So that's why you like watching Jackie Chan punch someone and jump out an exploding building because you're learning. You're learning how someone will react to that movement and you're learning how physics work on a grand scale that results in a massive dopamine release and hopefully it improves your own ability in sports. So thanks a ton for watching guys. I hope you found this video useful and interesting. If you did then please leave a like, please comment down below, let me know what your favourite action scenes are. I've got a ton more like this on the way on fitness, bodybuilding, performance, brain training, productivity, working online. So if that sounds great then let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next or more of and thanks once again tons for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.